In an eight-day period, starting April 16, 2010, some 107,000 commercial airline flights, representing nearly half of all European air travel and affecting some 10 million passengers, were canceled due to volcanic eruptions in Iceland in a place called Eyjafjallajökull. la Jokul. The extent of those cancellations has only been compared to the cancellation of all air travel in the United States after 9-11, and the International Air Transit Association estimates that the cost to airlines of all the cancellations was around 1.3 billion euros. But the decision to cancel all those flights was based on long experience. Human action has always been at the mercy of Mother Nature, and a uniquely human invention, mechanically powered flight, is particularly vulnerable to one of the most powerful forces of nature a volcanic eruption, and the interaction between volcanoes and aircraft is history that deserves to be remembered. Certainly, volcanoes have played a significant role in human history, as the remains of the people in the ancient Roman city of Pompeii would attest. A previous episode of The History Guy noted that the 1815 eruption of Mount Tambora in Indonesia affected the Battle of Waterloo in Belgium. A 2006 study funded by NASA determined that a 1783 eruption of another Icelandic volcano, Laki, that killed 9,000 Icelanders, caused a drought nearly 8,000 miles away in Egypt that reduced the population of the Nile Valley by one-sixth. Likewise, the 2010 eruption of Eyjafjallajökull dramatically impacted the African continent, with the canceled flights meaning that millions of fresh flowers and vegetables intended for European markets could not be exported costing, an April 2010 edition of the Concord, New Hampshire Monitor noted, the Kenyan economy more than $200 million, and causing the layoff of 5,000 agricultural day laborers there. But the development of powered flight is a relatively new development, and even newer is the development of commercial air travel, and so our experience of how airplanes interact with volcanoes would seem to be rather limited, and yet we've had enough to know that there is reason to be concerned. For example, the experience of the United States' 340th Bombardment Group. Constituted in August 1942, the 340th operated the North American B-25 Mitchell medium bomber in the Mediterranean theater. In January 1944, the group was assigned to operate from an American-built airfield in Italy, southeast of Naples, called Pompeii Airfield. Yes, that Pompeii. On March 20th, Mount Vesuvius, whose eruption in 79 AD had buried the ancient Roman city, erupted. Sergeant Robert McRae of the 340th Bombardment Group's 489th Squadron wrote that as the clouds pass from the, across the top of the mountain, the flame and lava can be seen shooting high into the sky. The eruption quickly proved to be more dangerous to the 340th than the Germans. McCray writes that at 2 a.m. the volcano seemed to explode. Mighty roaring occurred and pieces of lava as large as golf balls began to fall around me, 10 miles from the foot of the mountain. They beat upon the plains, setting up a racket in the black of that eventful night like hail on 10 roofs. But that was just the start. As the eruption continued, McCray notes that some of the falling stones were the size of footballs, tearing through metal, fabric, and plexiglass of the airplanes. The men of the group were evacuated, but the planes had to be left behind. When McCray and others were sent back to try to salvage what they could, he wrote, On reaching the airport, we found almost complete devastation. He lamented, 88 airplanes were a total loss. 88 B-25 Mitchells. $25 million worth of aircraft. The total loss of 88 bomber aircraft far exceeded the losses of any combat mission of the war, although the bomb group suffered no dead and only a few injuries. Such was the production rate of aircraft in the United States that the 340th was back operating at full strength, just 25 days later. But the risk from the 2010 eruptions at Eyjafjallajökull, ja Jokul, actually the name for an ice cap over a volcanic caldera, came not from the falling ash, but from the volcanic plume. The eruptions themselves were not actually that large, but the effects of the volcanic plume were almost as difficult to fathom as Eyjafjallajökull ja is to pronounce. A 2010 issue of The Guardian explains, The volcano erupted under glacial ice, with the water from the melting ice causing the lava to cool quickly and fragment into silica, small and abrasive glass particles, which are carried into the eruption plume. Iceland's location then allowed that plume to be carried into the jet stream. Volcanic ash is exceedingly dangerous to aircraft. The United States Geological Survey explains in a fact sheet, The world's busy air traffic corridors pass over hundreds of volcanoes capable of sudden explosive eruptions. 
In the United States alone, aircraft carry many thousands of passengers and millions of dollars of cargo over volcanoes every day. Volcanic ash can be a serious hazard to aviation, even thousands of miles from an eruption. Airborne ash can diminish visibility, damage flight control systems, and cause jet engines to fail. The cancellation of flights after the eruptions at Eyjafjallajökull yeah, Yokel were coordinated by various national civil aviation authorities using forecasting from the London Volcanic Ash Advisory Centre, or BAC. The London Centre is one of nine operating worldwide today, each covering a specific geographic area. The VACs represent groups of experts responsible for coordinating and disseminating information on atmospheric volcanic ash clouds that may endanger aviation. The system was established by a UN organization, the International Civil Aviation Organization, or ICAO, in the 1990s, following incidents involving encounters between commercial aircraft and volcanic ash. One of the notable examples was British Airways Flight 009. Flight 009 was a Boeing 747-200 named City of Edinburgh, but using the call sign Speedbird 9. The scheduled British Airways flight from London Heathrow to Auckland, with stops in Bombay, Kuala Lumpur, Perth, and Melbourne, was carrying 248 passengers and 15 crew. A 2010 edition of BBC News explained, There had been no hint of trouble when flight BA-009 took off from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia on the evening of 24 June 1982. Heading for Perth, Australia, the weather forecast for the five-hour journey was good, and the crew were anticipating an uneventful flight. An April 1986 edition of The Log, the magazine of the British Airline Pilots Association, explains that as the airplane flew south of Jakarta, Captain Eric Moody had a quick look at the area ahead of the aircraft with the weather radar and picked up nothing more interesting than returns from the surface of the sea. The captain then took a moment to descend the stairs to the first-class compartment and speak with the forward purser, but was quickly called back to the flight deck. As he climbed the stairs, he told the log, he noticed puffs of smoke, billowing out from the vents at floor level, and smell which he described as acrid or ionized electrical. When he returned to the flight deck, he found that the windshield was ablaze with St. Elmo's fire. St. Elmo's fire is a phenomenon that is caused by a coronal discharge in an atmospheric electrical field, sometimes occurs on the leading edge of airplanes. Moody told BBC that it's not unusual in high wispy clouds, but it developed into something more than we'd ever seen before. Looking out the side windows of the cockpit, the crew noticed the front engines were glowing, as if lit inside. Moody and the flight crew had little time to consider what was causing the strange phenomenon, as the log explains. Senior Engineer Officer Barry Townley Freeman called out, Engine failure, number four, then engine failure, number two, then three's gone, and finally, they've all gone. BBC dryly notes, Within a few moments, a passenger jet powered by four Rolls-Royce engines had become a glider. As they tried to figure out what was going on, Moody put the aircraft on autopilot, allowing it to lose altitude in a gentle glide as they worked the problem, and the crew issued a mayday to the Jakarta airport. BBC explains, while the crew on the flight deck were frantically trying to figure out the cause of this freak failure, many passengers were largely unaware that anything was wrong. Then perhaps the most memorable part of the event, BBC continues, but eventually, when the passenger oxygen mass dropped as the plane steepened its descent, the news had to be announced. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain speaking. We have a small problem. All four engines have stopped. We are all doing our damnedest to get them going again. I trust you are not in too much distress. The plane was losing altitude, and attempts to restart the engines were failing. The log writes, it was about this point that Eric began to consider the awesome consequences of attempting a dead stick touchdown on the sea at night. But just then, the crew was able to restart engine number four. The log explains, the other three engines started an almost interminable 90 seconds later. BBC writes that we glided from 37,000 feet to 12,000 feet before we got the engines going again, recalls Captain Moody. At the time, it was the longest glide in a non-purpose-built aircraft. Returning to Jakarta, the crew then encountered another difficulty. The log explains that the crew had difficulty finding the runway lights, only then realizing that the front windows were almost opaque. Only an edge of the left-hand front window was clear, allowing them to land. Despite the conditions, Moody, Senior First Officer Roger Graves, and Tanley Freeman had brought the plane safely down, but they still had no idea what had happened. 
Moody told the BBC with his characteristic understatement. It was, yeah, a little bit frightening. BBC explains, it was two days before investigators confirmed that volcanic ash had been responsible for the near disaster. The plane had flown through ash produced by an eruption of Mount Galangung, a volcano in West Java, some hundred miles from Speedbird 9's flight path. The event, often called the Jakarta event, represented one of the specific dangers of volcanic ash. The United States Geological Survey explains, Such dangerous and costly encounters between aircraft and volcanic ash can happen because ash clouds are difficult to distinguish from ordinary clouds, both visually and on radar. Also, ash clouds can drift great distances from their source. The log explains the severity of the damage to the engines. The tops of the blades were ground away where they were blasted by the ash at high speed. But that was not all, as the silicate inside the engine melted into a solid in the heat of the engines, a process called sintering, which happens inside steel furnaces. The log explains that changes in blade shape and size had serious effects on the efficiency of the engines. Aside from the damage, this can directly stall the engines, a 2010 edition of CNN explains. Volcanic ash contains particles whose melting point is below that of an engine's internal temperature. During flight, these particles will immediately melt if they go through an engine. Going through the turbine, the melted materials rapidly cool down, stick on the turbine vanes, and disturb the flow of high-pressure combustion gases. In the worst case, this disorder of the flow may stall the engine. Apparently, as Speedbird 9 descended out of the ash cloud, the ash solidified and cooled enough to break off, allowing the crew to restart the engines. In response, ICAO produced a report regarding the risk of volcanic ash to jet engines, suggesting, the log explains, that any pilot who encountered such a problem should, altitude permitting, reduce thrust to zero, descend, and leave the area as soon as possible. Given the inherent difficulty of detecting these ash clouds, the advice seemed inadequate. 19 days after BA Flight 009, a Singapore Air 747 had to shut down three engines flying through the same area. The plane dropped a mile and a half before the engines could be restarted. Only after this second incident was the route closed. Despite the ICAO report, a nearly identical event happened on December 15, 1989, to a nearly new Boeing 747-400 of Dutch airline KLM, en route from Amsterdam to Tokyo with a refueling stop in Anchorage, Alaska. The Anchorage Daily News wrote a KLM Boeing 747 was about five miles up and headed for Anchorage Friday when it flew into a cloud of ash from Redoubt Volcano and its four powerful turbofan engines stopped. A spokesman for the National Transportation Safety Board told the news that the KLM jumbo jet was about 75 miles northwest of Anchorage, descending from its cruising level of 39,000 feet when pilot Carl van der Elst saw what he thought was a dark cloud in front of him. The spokesman, Ray Daw, explained that the ash cloud does not show up on radar. Captain van der Elst realized that he had flown into the volcanic ash when the cabin started to fill with acrid smoke that was being sucked into the ventilation system. Ten to fifteen seconds later, Daw said, all four engines quit. The U.S. Geological Survey explains, For five long minutes, the powerless 747 jetliner, bound for Anchorage, Alaska, with 231 terrified passengers on board, fell in silence towards the rugged, snow-covered Talkeetna Mountains. Only after the crippled jet had dropped from an altitude of 27,900 feet to 13,300 feet, a fall of more than two miles, was the crew able to restart all engines and land the plane safely at Anchorage. A 20-year-old passenger told the Daily News, It was dark. People were screaming, throwing up. It was like you can imagine. Pretty near panic. In the end, the plane, less than six months old, required the replacement of all four engines, altogether $80 million in repairs. Another plane was nearly caught in the same cloud. The news writes that a Korean Airlines jet about 15 minutes behind KLM Flight 867 was quickly ordered to detour out of the path by air traffic controllers. It would be nice to think that these incidents were isolated, but that is not the case. For example, the U.S. Geological Survey notes that in less than three days, the ash cloud from the June 15, 1991 eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines traveled more than 5,000 miles to the east coast of Africa. This ash cloud damaged more than 20 aircraft, most of which were flying more than 600 miles from the volcano. One of those, a 747-300, had a three-minute encounter with volcanic ash, 
which, as with British Airways Flight 009 and KLM Flight 867, resulted in a thin haze inside the aircraft that smelled like a burning electrical wire. The aircraft was able to land in Manila safely, but after inspection, all four engines had to be replaced. Although no fatalities have so far occurred due to commercial airliners encountering volcanic ash, airplane maker Boeing reports that between 1970 and 2000, more than 90 commercial jets have been damaged from flying into volcanic ash. At least eight of those resulted in engine failures. And the U.S. Geological Survey notes that the growth in air traffic over volcanically active regions, such as the North Pacific, is increasing the chance of a deadly encounter. As a response to incidents such as BA-009 and KLM Flight 567, organizations such as the VAX have been established to help determine where dangerous volcanic ash might affect air routes and are seeking to actively monitor more volcanoes to improve warnings and make travel safer. And it was that better monitoring that allowed the preventive cancellation of flights to prevent accidents after the 2010 eruptions at Eyjafjallajökull, and in 2011 to ground some 9,000 flights after the eruption of another Icelandic volcano that's called Grimsvotin. But the cost of those mass cancellations has, according to a 2014 edition of Wired magazine, spurred airlines to help to develop new technologies that might use the infrared and ultraviolet spectrums to allow pilots to see and avoid volcanic ash. There is still some risk today, but hopefully these new technologies and better monitoring will relegate terrifying experiences like what happened to British Airways Flight 009 and KLM Flight 867 to nothing more than history. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you have to do is subscribe.